Dear Heavenly Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart or our hearts this morning be totally acceptable in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we had Christy take the, the message and this morning to set our minds on what we've been unpacking over the last month or so, the last few weeks, I'm going to read Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 20 and I'm going to do it from the Message Bible this morning which is something I said I would never do, I would never read the Message Bible in a sermon but I'm going to just to make it a little bit easier to understand. Colossians 1, 15 to 20, it says this. We look at this sun and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this sun and see God's original purpose in everything created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him, that's Jesus, and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. And when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. He was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade, he is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, Jesus is there, towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so expansive, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. As we listen to that, what is Paul trying to teach us? He says it over and over again. He's emphasizing that everything from beginning to end has taken place through and because of Jesus. And at the same time, Paul is trying to help us to understand what Jesus did in his work on the cross. Not only does it restore people's relationship to God, it actually restores the rest of creation, which is something that we don't think about that often because we talk about root wars and rumours of wars and landslides and floods And that is a part of the fall as well. So it is restoring the rest of creation. He wants us to know that Jesus provided the way for us to be reconciled to God. Something that we don't think about often through all that he accomplished on the cross. And this reconciliation that we have with God, it came at a price. There was a cost, and that cost was the death of Jesus. We we need to remember that it was Jesus that served as a once-for-all substitute on behalf of us. It covered all of our sins. So Paul is setting the scene in these last verses that I just read, he's setting the scene for Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, which is what we were going to deal with this morning. And I was hoping that we'd get more than two verses, but no, we're only going to get one in reality. Colossians 1, 21 and 22 says this, And you, talking to Christians, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds... He, Jesus, has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. I think it's interesting that as believers who live in a culture that has reaped 
the benefits of the influence of Christianity for the last thousand years. And that we are also often the product of Christian influence from our parents. I think that we don't really contemplate, think about what Paul means when he writes verse 21. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. We actually skip straight to verse 22 because we say that's not us. And 22 is about being reconciled to God. But today I actually want to concentrate on Colossians 1.21 and you. Who were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. I want us to look closely at those three things and what they mean. Consider this. What does it mean to be alienated from God? What does hostile in mind, in mind actually mean? And what does the Bible mean that we are doing evil deeds? Because most of us immediate will, immediately will say, I don't do evil deeds. So let's start. What does it mean to be alienated from God? The word alienate or alienation just simply means to be a foreigner or to be a stranger. What we need to understand that this alienation means that we have made ourselves strangers to God. He knows who we are, but we are alienated from him. We have become strangers because of our sin. Now we use that word and no one, really under, no one really understands what that means. Because we think of it as a sort of a concept. But what is sin? Sin is the simple fact that we have rebelled against God. We've told him to rack off and we will do what we want. And even though we might not know or even understand what happened to alienate us from God. Sometimes it's by ignorance and sometimes it's by choice. But we choose not to see what is right in front of our eyes. We, we choose not to see the reality of life. You don't know what I'm talking about. But Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1 verse 19. He says this. For what can be known about God is plain to them. It means we have, have no excuse because God has shown it to them. And as I was thinking about this, I realized that every time it rains, each time the grass grows, we see God's amazing planning and forethought. Each time we see... A newborn baby example at the back. We see a tiny example of creation. See, we witness the awesome power of our God. Each time we see the storm clouds roll in. And I don't know about you, but that first wind gives you the shiver. There's that awesome lightning as it rips across the sky. And his power is what you hear as the thunder rolls. That's why Paul writes the very next verse, Romans 1 verse 20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In the things that have been made. So we are without excuse. It goes further than that. Paul writes in Ephesians 4. They are darkened or we are darkened in our understanding. Alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to the hardness of our hearts. See the thing that we've got to understand and take deep into us is that we were designed to be more like God than any other created being. I have a look at Genesis chapter 1. God 
originally created humanity to live in constant communication with him. God didn't want robots. He didn't want robots that were forced to love him. Rather, he gave us free will. We were able to choose to have friendship with God. We were able to choose to be in relationship with him or to choose something else. If you go back to Genesis, Genesis shows that we chose to alienate ourselves. Genesis 2.17. We take this, but we don't think about this verse often. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in it, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. You shall surely die. Think about that. It's not like he didn't warn us. It wasn't, you know, for Adam and Eve, it wasn't a quince or a fig or a persimmon or an apple. It was the fact that they chose. God is telling us clearly there, make a choice, but make the wrong choice and something will happen. He's saying clearly to him, I made everything. Everything hangs together by my power. I've given you everything. You do need me to survive, but I'm not going to force you to love me. And I'm not going to force you to serve me. What I want is I want you to choose to be my friend. And see, one of the things that we have to understand is God says to us, I hold the universe together. This is the sad part. But if you don't want a part of of my universe if you don't want a part of me you can have what you want I will give it to you however if you choose not to be a friend then you have to leave we can't be friends we can't have fellowship see one of the things that we've got to understand is hell is our choice Hell is the place that we get to choose to be in. And it's the ultimate alienation from God. And at that point, there is no hope of being reconciled to God. But think about this, and I love this. God is still gracious and he is still kind because he says to us, I will give you all the time that you have in your life. And you can choose whether you want to be a friend with me. Or not. For the whole of our lives, God is always saying, Come to me, come to me. Ephesians 2 says this For God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, come to me. Tie this together. The reason that Jesus came into the world was to make peace for us with God. To reverse the alienation that we have with God. To make a way. Jesus came to reconcile us. But see, one of the things that we have to understand is that alienation from God involved a debt that we couldn't pay. And I've been trying to think of an illustration of this. But it's like us having children. And we say to the children, don't do that. But they do. In a sense, there is no way for their child to do anything except say sorry. There's nothing they, they can pay or do or give. You, you're the one that says, that's okay. But there is a cost in that. If you think about it deeply, there is a cost. There is the cost of disappointment on the part of the parent. And if this was a uh, a true thing God says look there's a cost you, you've, you've broken everything there's a cost just as my child can never pay that I as the parent are going to say I'll pay it I will pay it that's why Jesus came God, Jesus took that debt on himself so that those who are alienated from God have a way of not 
cementing in place the choice that they've made. Not cementing in place the choice that they want alienation from God for all eternity. God made a way. God the Father sent God the Son to pay the debt we could not pay. He sent Jesus to take the punishment that we deserve for rebelling against him. Jesus took the debt on himself to break the perpetual alienation that we have from God. And what happens? What does that mean? If you accept Jesus, it says this, Ephesians 2.19, love this verse, so that you are no longer strangers or aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. We were estranged. We were left out. We were left behind. We were excluded from relationship with God and fellowship with God. But now, because of what Jesus did, we're no longer alienated. See, Paul wants us to truly understand that we were separated from God prior to coming to faith in Jesus Christ. But what he also wants us to remind or reminds us of is that we were hostile in mind and doing evil deeds. Now read it again. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. That's the thing we pass over quickly. Because we say, oh, no, I wasn't. The translation is a little bit, it's absolutely right, but it's so harsh that we don't understand it. See, where it says hostile in mind, there is more in the Greek, in the Greek word. Because it gives, it's supposed to give us the idea of being an enemy in your own mind towards God. Paul is trying to get us to understand that we are being hostile in our own minds toward Jesus. The Jesus that, that, that Paul has just mentioned, who's not only our creator, <coughs> who is not only our sustainer, but we're actually being hostile to ourselves. We're choosing the wrong thing. See, that being alienated and hostile towards Jesus is to be in a headspace that's out of tune with the reality of God. It's why we dis discount him. Paul is trying to get us to understand that we're actually fighting against our own true self-interest when we dismiss God. Paul talks in Romans 7 about this. He says, for I do not do the good I want. But the evil, the worthless, and that evil there also means worthless and harmful. That's why I've put it in there. But the evil I do, the worthless things, the harmful things I do, I do not want is what I keep on doing. I keep living in a circle. I never move forward. And if you think about life, and so many of us as Christians still in a sense live like that. Living like that leads to that conflict that you have in yourself. It leads to confusion, not knowing what you're going to do or what you want to do. Our lives are always internally troubled. We can't get out of it. We can't get our thoughts straight. We are hostile to ourselves. We can't control our thinking. We can't control our, our feelings. And the truth is, if you think about it, you are actually and honestly being self-destructive. We are hostile in mind. The problem is, is that our minds see our lives and cause us to think that how we are without Jesus is normal. And that normal is good. And I think as Christians we have to be very careful. We can't point our fingers at the world. We can't be self-righteous. We can't be confident in ourselves. We can't make excuses. I hate, hate that bumper sticker. <coughs> Remember that in the old days, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. It's an excuse to live how you want. 
or the other thing that I hear so often, well, nobody's perfect. It's an excuse. See, Paul is actually making us face the reality that it's this nobody's perfect attitude that separates us from God. Because God does want us to be holy. God does want us to be perfect. See, we need actually a... And we need to understand that there's no contingency plan except for Jesus. There is no backup route to the promised land for those who do not become righteous. And we Christians must never, never look down on on other people. Because there's to be no pride because we're like that as well. Remember what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8? For at one time you were darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. There but for the grace of God go I. Paul also warns us in Ephesians 5.15. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise but as wise. Making the best use of the time. Because the days are evil. And there in that word evil, we just read evil. But the days are hurtful to our character. If you live in them. So don't become proud. I was thinking of that parable that Jesus tells in Luke 18. Where the two men go to the temple. The Pharisee, the religious one. Luke 18.10, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Let's make it modern. Two men went to the church to pray. One was a minister and one the owner of a brothel. That's about as modern as you can get and truthful. The proud Religious person says in Luke 18, 11, the minister stands by himself saying, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other men. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not even like this brothel owner. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. So I tithe my own salary. Whereas the brothel owner Whereas the person that realized that their reliance and their position before God was all because of Jesus. But the brothel owner stood at the back of the church. He wouldn't even lift his eyes up to the cross. But God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. We both know, we all know who left the church forgiven. See, in all of this, Paul wants us to realize that it's those rebellious thoughts that lead to our rebellious lives. It's being hostile in mind. But he also wants us to understand that the reverse is true. That right thinking leads to right behavior. Being in right relationship with God will lead you forward. See, truly giving ourselves to Jesus makes it possible for the first time for the Lord to create in us something that is new and clean and fresh. Let us know the real reality. And that's what Paul's showing us here. But he's also making it bloody. Trying to get us to understand the depth of it all, the darkness of it all, the harshness of it all. Paul is telling us that it's Jesus' death on the cross that provides the way for us to be reconciled to God. He's saying, take it seriously. Don't take it flippantly. 
And here it is, finally. In Jesus, that peace of mind that you've subconsciously wanted your whole lives. That subconscious want to be in harmony with God, not be alienated from him. This happens only because Jesus sacrificed himself. Jesus took the punishment for our rebellion. He let himself be put to death. He let his body replace our bodies. He took our sin. Why? So that you can stand before God and say, Thank you, Father, so we can be reconciled. As we go back to Colossians 1.20, Paul is trying to get us to, you know, maybe for the first time, to truly understand the seriousness of what it is to be alienated from God. He's trying to get us to understand the consequences of, of the reality that we've made ourselves strangers to God. I remember when I was a teenager, uh, I've always liked weird books, but I came across a book, and it was a book that was written in 1646, just after my mother was born. <laughs> it was written by a group of English and Scottish theologians, they all got together and they decided that they were going to ask themselves some questions and they were going to answer these questions. Now, I've made it in modern English. But the first question they asked is, what's the main purpose of being a human being? Don't you ever ask, why am I here? They came up with the answer, our main purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And I think sometimes we get stuck on that glorifying God because we find it terribly boring. I like the last half of that sentence because I actually like to enjoy life. In glorifying God, knowing God, being reconciled to, to God, being a friend of God, it is to enjoy him and to enjoy life. Our main purpose is to know God, understand him and enjoy him. And you know what? It allows all the other relationships that you have to come into balance and to be a blessing to you and you to them. But there was a second question. And I'm paraphrasing, but it goes something like, what has God given us to show us how we can both glorify and enjoy him at the same time? And they came up with this answer. The Bible is what God gave us to show us how we can glorify and enjoy him. Get this into your heart. Get this into your mind. Get this into your soul. Know this. If you take one thing away from this morning, know that that peace of heart, that contentment of soul, that untroubled mind. You know that enjoyment that you, that enjoyment of life that you've sort of cried out for your whole life is only actually one choice away. It takes lifelong commitment, but it's one choice away. And that choice is only possible because of what it says in Colossians 1.22. Jesus has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy, you blameless, and you above reproach before God the Father.
peace of heart, contentment of soul, untroubled mind, enjoyment of life can only be truly true because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your Son so that we can be reconciled to you if we accept you. Let us remember that it is not that it is a once-off thing, but it is a daily process. Lord, help us to enjoy you today and this week and all the wonderful blessings and benefits that you have given us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.